bashful. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody. Uh, today I'm starting a six uh, city tour around Ohio to really just talk about where we are in our battle against uh, the COVID. We want to start here uh, in Cedarville. Uh, Dr. Kevin Sherritt, uh, family physician and someone who is really experienced this and is seeing this uh, every single day in, in his practice. Uh, in addition to his position as coroner of the county, um, he is uh, in charge of rural health for Kettering uh, Health Network. Uh, so he really has seen this change and move into the rural parts of the state. Um, Western Ohio, uh, our part of the state, is really the hottest part of the state. If you look at, look at the numbers, and I have the, all of our counties here, uh, every single county uh, is now at least at least five times the CDC high incident level. So we have no, no counties uh, in the state, and we have no counties in Western Ohio that is not very, very high. Uh, again, this is probably what is the highest part of the state as far as the spread uh, of the COVID. So I'm gonna now introduce Dr. Kevin Sherritt. He's gonna talk a little bit about what he is seeing uh, in, in his practice. Doctor, thank you. thank you. Good morning. As the governor just described, right now we are experiencing the effects of the COVID virus more than we ever have before. You know, when I discuss this with the patients each and every day that, that certainly want to know what's happening, what's going on, the best way I can describe the situation we're in is that this virus can be likened to a fire, like a wildfire that's spreading across our nation, that's spread across our nation. In fact, it's spread across the world. And fortunately for us, in the beginning stages of this, in the beginning days and weeks, we were watching from a distance, and we were watching the fire burn on television in metropolitan areas across the land, and we really weren't affected much. And I had patients coming in every day and asking me, is this real? Does this exist? Because I don't know anybody who has a virus. I don't know anyone who's sick. I don't know anyone who's died. Unfortunately, in the days and weeks that followed, and certainly over the last 30 days, we've seen that change. And we are right now in the throes of this fire. This fire is raging around us right now. And as someone who is working uh, within a provider network here in our region that is doing everything it can to fight this fire and to try to control the fire. Now when you approach a fire you have two options. Basically you can let the fire burn and you can let it burn out of control. And we know the consequences of that, the devastation and the destruction that occurs when a wildfire burns out of control. Or we can try to control the fire and make it a controlled burn. And when you do that you limit the damage, you limit the devastation. So that's what our network and the networks around us are trying to do. Right now, as I stand here, as I speak, we cannot extinguish this fire. Today, we cannot extinguish it. We do not have the tools available today to extinguish this fire. So our best strategy, our best approach is to try to control the fire. And each and every day, our team is working, meeting, strategizing, looking at how we can control the fire how the fire can be maintained and controlled. Because you see, even though this pandemic fire is raging around us, unfortunately, cancer goes on. Strokes happen, heart attacks happen, accidents occur. And so the challenge that we have as providers is to be able to provide the care needed on a daily basis, which is a full-time job, and at the same time mitigate this fire and control it. As the governor said, the cases are rising each and every day at record levels. And as the cases rise, and so do hospitalizations, so do ICU admissions, so does ventilator usage, and unfortunately, so does death. Now, on a positive note, we're learning more about this fire every day, and we're learning better ways to try to control it. And it's, those ways are effective, and they're, and they're useful. But nonetheless, the fire is real, and it is raging. You know, this morning I thought about it. It was just one month ago today 
that one of the first among us in our area, Dr. Mukhu Chandra, came down with this virus. And he fought, he fought hard for s over six months fighting this virus. For those of you who knew him and were his patients, knew that he was the epitome of health. He was a director of a preventive health team. He was an avid runner. He was at the prime of his career. And yet, this virus destroyed his lungs. And he died one month ago today while he was waiting for a double lung transplant. As I think back, I think of the countless patients that I've seen that have been affected by this virus. You know, this virus can be likened to a fire, but it can also, I tell patients that it only took minutes for the tornado to destroy Xenia over 40 years ago. Those of us are old enough to remember. And yet it took years to clean up the mess. Well, this virus, just like the tornado, will pass. But it's going to take us a long time to clean up the mess. And unfortunately for some of us, that have had the virus, some of our patients have had the virus, They've, they'll never be the same. I have a patient who's 34 years old that the virus has affected his heart. He's now on oxygen and he's probably never going to work again to support his family. I have other patients that have affected all the complications that you can imagine. Central nervous system, heart, lungs, kidneys, and they're never going to be the same from this virus. So this virus is real and it exists, and it is raging now hotter than ever in our community. Our local nursing homes, our local schools are fighting each and every day, and it spreads quickly. One of our local nursing homes, within a 48-hour period, virtually every resident in the home was affected with the virus, and unfortunately many died. So it is real, and so when people ask me, does it exist? It exists, trust me, it exists, and it's real. So people ask, what can we do? Patients ask, what we can do? Well, we all know instinctively that wherever there's a fire, when you play with fire, you get burnt. The closer to the fire you get, the hotter it gets. So the first strategy is to stay away from the fire. I advise patients to avoid any exposure whatsoever. Now, the reality is, if you are out in public, you are being exposed. So you have to weigh the risk and the benefit. Is it worth the risk? to expose yourself and expose your families to this fire. So the first strategy is to avoid the fire any way possible. If you do have to go out, wear a mask. Now, I have caught a, a lot of flack about my mask public service announcement that the governor asked me to do. And I'll be the first one to tell you, this mask is not perfect. It does not make you bulletproof. It will not completely protect you from this fire. But right now, other than social distancing and staying away from the fire, it's the best tool that we have. Along with that is just general health uh, practices in terms of cleanliness and sanitation and all of those things that, that we can do to uh, mitigate and to slow down the spread because we can't extinguish the fire right now. It's burning. Now, there are the patients that I see, the majority of them get it. The majority of them understand it. And the majority of them are doing everything they can do. But patients ask every day, what can we do to help you? Well, the first thing that you can do to help us is to stay out of arm's way and stay out of the fire. Because when someone gets in the fire, we have to send first responders in to rescue them. And right now, our system is strained. We're keeping up with it, and our leaders are doing an excellent job and I'm proud to serve with like-minded providers that put service above self and are living the mission each and every day and putting themselves in arm's way along with their families. But the best thing that anyone can do is to avoid this virus and take it seriously. Because when one falls, we all fall. And it has an impact on each and every one of us. So I admonish everyone to take all the precautions they can, social distance, wear a mask, wash your hands, and weigh the risk, and avoid at all, at all possible any exposure that you may have. Now, there's no question in my mind, this fire, like all fires, will be extinguished. It'll either be extinguished or it'll burn itself out. And I believe that we are in the darkest hour. You know, in 1650, Thomas Fuller said, the darkest hour occurs before the day dawneth. And as I see the sun coming up this morning, as beautiful as it is, a new day is dawning. 
and this fire will be extinguished. There's no question in my mind about that. The only question I have is how much more destruction there will be between now and then. How many more people will fall prey? How many more people's lives will be changed? And so we need, at this point in time, not to panic, but to pay attention and to do everything we can. Locally in our area, right now the fire is raging. This is serious. And so I'm just asking everyone to do your part and to do everything you can to help us take better care of you. So with that in mind, Governor, I'll Thank turn you. it back over. Uh, just, just an additional comment. Um, you know, one of the things that we're asking people to do is to do something every single day where they're pulling back, something that they would have normally done, don't do it. Um, reducing the number of contacts uh, that we all have is, is absolutely essential. Uh, this is why we put the curfew in that will start tomorrow night uh, at, at 10 o'clock, getting people to pull back. But in addition to that, we're just asking people, you know, every single day, uh, you know, be mindful of how you can reduce your contacts w with other people. Uh, if you're looking at, at going out uh, shopping, uh, you know, try to consolidate that. Uh, grocery store in the spring, you know, we all kept a list and people only made one trip a week or one trip every, every few days to do that. Um, so this is one way kind of get back to what we did in the spring, pull back a little bit. If people can pull back, you know, we will, in fact, uh, slow this down. We have some counties in the Miami Valley that now, within the last two weeks, one out of every hundred person uh, has come down with COVID, and that is just in the last two weeks. So uh, we're at a very, very dangerous time, but uh, as Dr. Sherrod said, there is hope out there, and uh, we heard yesterday morning uh, great news, the day before great news. We have at least two vaccines coming on. Uh, we're going to get those out as soon as we can. They're going to start coming, we're told. At least one of them is going to start coming, we hope, in December. And we're going to get those out to the most vulnerable populations, and we would hope then over the months ahead to get, get that out. So we've got to build a bridge, uh, and the bridge between where we are today uh, and where we're going to be when we get get the vaccine. So uh, we'll open up for questions. Why don't you start with Dr. Sherritt. Can you um, just kind of talk to us about the status of, of hospitals in the Miami Valley right now? We're seeing more and more cases every day. So how are hospitals handling all that? So as you see the numbers of cases going up, hospitalizations follow that. And so right now, as I said earlier, our network is uh, huddling each and every day, developing contingency plans and strategies to deal with that. Right now, we are doing well. Right now, patients are being cared for. We have not exhausted resources. We've been working with other networks in the region and working collaboratively together with the Greater Dayton Area Hospital Association to make sure that everyone is cared for and everyone is being cared for. But let, let's make no bones about it. We're feeling the heat, and we're under more strain now than we have been up to this point in time. And I know we're getting into flu season, too. If, if there's a chance that we run out of beds, run out of ventilators, is there a plan for that? There's, there are plans across not only within our network but with across the region. And right now there is not a concern about the availability of resources. I talk, Kevin, about people. About what now? The people. Oh, yeah. The... Uh, you know, the people are, um, are our biggest concern right now is not only our patients, uh, we're always obviously concerned about them, but we're seeing the, the activity of this virus occurring in the age group between 30 and 59, which is our workforce. And right now we have an incredible concern for our caregivers, for our team members, to keep them healthy, to keep them safe, because without them we can't provide the care that's needed for everybody else. Are you finding yourself having to fly in extra help in hospitals here in our area because they're getting sick? No, as far as right now, we have the, the manpower and the resources that, uh, that we need to care for the uh, load that we have right now. And um, like I said, our focus is, is to keep our people healthy and we're doing everything we can to do that. We've implemented strategies and procedures to keep them as healthy as we can. And we are seeing it, you know, our, this, this virus is not a respecter of persons. So as I mentioned uh, before, it, uh, we are very sensitive for our nurses, our physicians, all of our team members. You know, from the time you step on one of our campuses, you are greeted by someone 
who has put service above self, and they're putting themselves in arm's way. So right now, we're putting an extra emphasis on our own people to try to keep them healthy and safe. And right now, it's, it's working. As far as the Pfizer vaccine, um, the FDA, they'll say that the FDA will um, have emergency use within days. Can you talk to me about that, and when do you think that Ohio is expected to get these doses? We're told that uh, we're told that Ohio um, will get its first shipment in, in likely in December. Uh, so we're looking at that. It'll be uh, not a large shipment. We're told that the first shipment will be 30,000. Um, we don't know how soon the second one and the third one, but this is going to come in, in, in tranches. Uh, we have a plan to get it out. Uh, what we will do initially uh, is try to seal off our nursing homes. Uh, and the way we do that is by making sure everybody in the nursing home uh, gets the vaccine. Uh, it's coming into the nursing homes, uh, you know, f from the community. Uh, and so people who work there live in the community. And so when the, the, the incidents go up as we have it today, it's very difficult to keep it out of nursing homes. We want to seal these nursing homes off in a sense and uh, make people safe. The, the, next, the next group uh, right about the same time is going to be health care providers who are at the forefront and, you know, who we absolutely have to keep healthy. So and then we'll move on from there. Uh, how fast this is going to come, I don't think anyone really knows. Uh, some estimates have been that we'll be into the general population by March or April. Um, you know, we certainly hope so. We would, would hope by midsummer that we would start getting the immunity level that, that we need. So we literally got to build a bridge from here to there. Uh, good news is it's coming. Uh, bad news is it's not here. We got to go through the next few months. And what really is at stake? Uh, in keeping this virus down uh, is whether we can keep our schools open and keep kids in school, uh, whether or not we can protect our elderly in, in nursing homes, and whether we can keep our hospitals from being overrun. Uh, if you look at the numbers of, we put it up on a chart every single day. A month ago, uh, we had 1,000 people in the hospital. Uh, about a week ago, we had 2,000. Today, we're about 3,500 in our hospitals around the state. So it's, so it's a lagging indicator. Uh, you get first cases before you get hospitalizations, and it's just it's going up. And with what we've been averaging, 7,000 to 8,000 cases a day in the state, these numbers uh, are going to continue to go up as far as hospitalization. What we got to do is get the cases down. We got to get the number of incidents down. Uh, it's, wear, it's wearing a mask. It's keeping a distance. It's the it's the basic things that we know work. So. Well, I'm, I'm, I have great faith in the people of Ohio. People of Ohio uh, in, the, in the spring uh, flattened the curve, did what needed to be done. We got another big spike in June and July. Uh, people started wearing more masks, particularly in the, in the urban areas, which is where we were seeing the spread then. So this is the third huge spike. Uh, it is much bigger, much greater. Uh, than anything we've seen before. Uh, what's different about this, and one of the reasons I wanted Dr. Sherritt to be here, uh, is this is in our rural areas. It is led by our rural areas. I mean, it's everywhere. It's in our urban areas. But in the spring and summer, you, you could live in Clinton County or you could live in Fayette County, and you might not know uh, anybody who'd had the COVID. Uh, today, uh, it's increasingly difficult for anybody to live in any county and not know someone who's had the COVID. So it's really spread out. Into, into the rural areas. So it's, it's much different than, than, than it was. But Ohioans have stepped up before. Uh, w you know, we decided to do a 21-day uh, curfew uh, as one additional way to try to slow this down. But really, it still comes back to what individual Ohioans do. Wearing a mask, pulling back, reducing your contacts. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a very, very dangerous time, and we've got to, we've got to slow this virus down. What we do um, after 21 days, I don't know. I'm hoping that we're able to knock this down. Uh, you know, we're going to see. Everyone has to uh, be on board, and we need, every, we need everybody's help. Uh, we, we put uh, inspectors out on Monday uh, to go into our uh, retail outlets. Um, you know, when you walk into a grocery store, as a customer, you have every right to expect everybody in that grocery store is wearing a mask to protect you. 
And imagine if you're a 65-year-old clerk who's diabetic, uh, you're a checkout, and you're seeing people all day, and you're wearing a mask, uh, but then you've got people who are coming in who aren't wearing masks. And that's not fair. That's not right. It's not the right thing to do. So we're just asking everyone, you know, let's, let's wear masks. Let's be careful. Uh, let's see if we can knock this, knock this virus down. Who else? Anybody else? And just to clarify on that first shipment that's coming in in December, which vaccination is that? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure which one that will be. We'll have to see what the, you know, again, we're getting the information, but, um, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see. It's a, it, you know, it's an estimate from the federal government of what will happen when, but they've not given us a date. You know, we don't have a date. They've indicated, they hope, in December. Uh, but it's coming, and we've got, now we've got two. Now we've got two that look like they're coming, and that's, uh, that's great news. How is it decided how that vaccine is distributed state by state? Is it Congress? Is it federal dollars? What is that? Well, the distribution is going to be based basically on population. So every state is going to get some uh, and will get it about the same time. So, um, but we're not going to have enough, obviously, initially to get into the general population. So we're going to start at the most vulnerable populations. We're going to start with our health workers uh, and work out, work out from there. Anybody else? Well, it may not change it for them, uh, but there are people who are up beyond 10 o'clock at night. And, uh, you know, this is one attempt so that we don't have to shut the economy down, but that we can pull back significantly. Uh, I mean, think about this on a college campus, for example. Uh, some of you have some of you aren't too far away from that age. What do people do at 10 o'clock at night? Well, they're not usually back in their dorm. So it, it, it's a way to say, look, you know, go about your life, wear a mask, be careful. 10 o'clock, go home. Go home at 10 o'clock. Every retail outlet in the state will be closed at 10 o'clock with the exception of, of pharmacies and, and groceries if they're open. And many of them, of course, are not open at 10 o'clock. Uh, but every other retail outlet is going to be closed in the state. So it, it is a dramatic change. Um, for those who go to bed at 9 o'clock at night, it's not going to change their life. Uh, but uh, for other people, it will. And we're trying to just do everything that we can to, to pull this thing, pull this thing down. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank Thanks, guys. Kevin. All right, Dolly. Go back in. Kevin, let's head back in.